And it's another episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-based founders and executives tell the stories that matter. It's good to be with you again. My name is Paul Edwards, and this is Jason Todd, my co-host. Jason, great to see you again. How are you today, my friend? I am excellent. Looking forward to this conversation uh, from a seasoned individual. I know we were talking about his bio before, before the show. We're chuckling a little bit uh, because you know him personally, but this is... This is sort of a, a, a heavyweight sort of bio. I, I just want to read this yeah. for our viewers and listeners. Four million words written, 10,000 hours of consulting and speaking experience, co-author of 12 professional development tools, 500 articles, four books, and a profound impact on the world's leadership landscape for the last 34 years. That's Talk impressive. About- yeah. Talk about a quest for purpose. Let's bring him on. Dr. Ken Keese joining us for the Emissary Authors Podcast. Ken, how are you, my friend? Great to see you again. Great. I was just said, who, who has that bio? I was just kind of curious. <laughs> oh, some guy we found on the street. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, there you go. Good to see you again, Paul. And nice and, to meet you, Jason. And great to have you along with us. And, um, you know, that's... Uh, talking about a quest for purpose. I'm, I'm excited to dig into that for our audience, uh, especially from the point of view of becoming an author, but just also in general, you know, Mm -hmm. it's clear that that kind of resume up front is, is enough to tell anybody this guy has pursued, uh, all throughout his life and career, uh, new levels, new levels of understanding, new levels of purpose, new levels of maturity, whatever it may be. <clears throat> and, um, you know, uh, just where does it, where does that all begin for you? What's the, what's the background? Uh, I'd like to get into that, but I want to just set up one thing for the listeners and viewers first. And that is, you know, the saddest point is I believe that all of us are divinely created for a purpose and that we have a very high level of contribution to make, and there's no accidents, there's no mistakes. So the. So the framework about my story is that this applies to everybody in some way, in some context, and there's no exclusions to that. So with that, I mean, I grew up on a dairy farm and I'm the first born male, Eastern European descent, third generation. Gentlemen, do you think there was any pressure for me to stay on the farm? (laughs) Yes. Okay. So I was on the farm, I, was, I came back from agriculture college, I was working with my father and it was obvious it was just not working personality wise. I mean, his style of leadership and me, it just didn't work. So I left the farm. And of course, when I left, uh, what did the family say? Well, you betrayed us because we did all of this for you. So a lot of times as individuals, we get caught into certain streams or directions. I mean, how many times do you see, well, They're in the same profession that their parents, their uncle, their aunt, their family was at some time or another. It might be correct. It might not be. I don't know. I can't answer that for you. But I knew for me, I left that and then I went into government agriculture and then I went to a sales position. And I knew that I was always to be a speaker. Even when I was 16 years of age, I was part of the 4-H program. I was doing uh, speaking then. I was MC at 17, 18, 19 of many groups. However, Jason, you might not be aware of this. I was dyslexic. And so I couldn't read or write. My grade nine English teacher said I would never amount to anything because of this disability. And of course, back when I went through school, even though I look very young on camera, there was no such thing as a computer. There was no such thing as um, learning programs or assistance for individuals that had these kinds of conditions. And so as I moved along and into my uh, 20s, I started to uh, get into more education, took my MBA, and that was, of course, the invention of the computer. And I started to do all this writing. And this program called Word, which has this little red line, was the reason, is the reason that I was even able to write. And instead of my handwritten scribe, you can't read. So I'm, I think through my fingertips. And that's where all this... Uh, development or this authorship started to occur, quite frankly, in in my 30s. But I got up one morning and I actually started my own dairy farm. So I left the farm because I couldn't be under that leadership. And I was working as an agricultural salesperson. But I also started my own dairy farm, which was like a 10 or a 15 year journey to get there. And I didn't want to abandon that. But I got up one morning. So it's 530 in the morning. The sun is coming up here on the Pacific Northwest. 
And I ask myself this question, if I am standing here 20 years from now, is that okay? Mm. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, is that all that I'm going to bring? Not that it was demeaning to anybody that's in that profession. I just knew that there was a destiny that was more than that. And that's when I moved into starting a sales training franchise or, or joining one and then into this holistic development in no way, even in the, my mid twenties, could you have convinced me that I would be an author? I mean, that was the furthest from my mind. So a lot of times when we think about purpose, it's something you need to peel back. You need to look back. You need to discover. So in 1989, and this is an individual where you used to live, uh, Paul. Uh, was Mike McManus. Mike McManus was an educator in Washington state, and he created a program called the source to help keep kids in school because they were disenfranchised. They were dropping out at 20, 30, 40%. And he quickly discovered that this is for adults. <clears throat> well, I had joined the national speakers association in 1989. And when I was there at one of the conferences, uh, Sharon says, you need to meet Mike. Because I knew I was supposed to speak, but I didn't know about what to who, mm. you know, for what purpose. So I went, and this is way before coaches were in vogue, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I drove from Vancouver, excuse me, Vancouver, Canada, and down to Seattle every month, you know, two, two and a half hours each way for a better part of three quarters of a year to go through this journey with him to say, you know, what is it that I really want to do? And yeah. that really led to this journey of my purpose in life, which is to help others to live, lead, and work on purpose. And after 25 years in the profession, then I started on my own journey to say, how can I refine a roadmap for people to discover their purpose so they can be clear about who they are? And that is the book, The Quest for Purpose, which is now an e-course and available in that format. And it's interesting. I know that you started this whole show about authors. It is so important. I started in this industry, you know, I started as, um, in 1986 as Toastmaster, um, president. And I pretended I, and I met Zig Ziglar in person, but I pretended to be him. I sucked. It was terrible to be a presenter. I mean, the, everybody talks about being authentic and now there's actual research that shows that when you're really in your authentic voice, you actually give off this positive energy when you're faking it. When you're full of it, whatever, I know we're going to keep the language clean here, but when you're full of it, is that it, that energy comes across. You know, I don't buy it. That's why most people don't trust politicians because they're talking and they're not telling the truth. We know they're not telling the truth, though their words are trying to deceive you otherwise. So when we're thinking about writing and authorship and in moving into this space of publishing and as a publishing company of psychological tools and assessments, which Jason, uh, Jason alluded to, you know, is this my authentic voice? Is this who I am and, and not trying to be somebody else? You know, the 4 million words I wrote were actually before artificial intelligence. <laughs> so I actually had to write them and I might've sourced some, uh, things online, but you know, can you tell your story yeah. and Paul, you're an amazing storyteller. So what connects for people? It connects your story, which is unique to you. Well, is there another purpose book out there? Sure there is, but I, nobody's going to tell it like I'm telling it. Is there a book in you? Yes, there is. And every single person listening, if that's what you are called to do, but it has to be with your twist, your, your spirit, your uh, heart, your soul into that medium. So you've been doing this a long time, talking to be talking to people and helping them find their purpose and 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 I, this living, working on purpose, how do you define purpose? Well, I do. And it's an interesting question. And people usually, by the way, Jason, that's one of the first times people have asked that that way. But I believe that it's an intuitive thing that when you are in this space of purpose, in other words, your calling, your assignment, is that uh, there's no such thing as the word motivation. There's inspiration, but if you're doing what you love to do, you, uh, you do not have to motivate yourself. Inspiration is this drive, this drawing. So there's some people that are listening, watching, they love golf. And, uh, so I would say, Hey, we got a tea time. The weather's beautiful outside. Let's go. Do you have to think, Oh, I don't know if I motivate the golf or not. I mean, you are right there right away. So if somebody says, Ken, 
we have an audience of 5,000 people and you're coming to speak about spirituality or purpose or personality, whatever. I don't have to think about that. Uh, yeah. And you're correct. I've done 3,000 presentations. One of those presentations I've done nearly a thousand times. And you know what? I actually just did this presentation not that long ago. And I was even more excited about doing it on the thousandth time than the first time. Well, the only thing that would generate that is my purpose. So yeah. that I'm in that space where this is compelling, it's drawing, it's when you do what you are supposed to be doing, it is not draining you. Now, yes, I have draining days. We have days where we're, we're done, but the majority of your life is really representing this energy that you bring, which is this affirmation that I'm in the right space. And hopefully as people are listening to my tonality, my energy, how I engage, that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. So hopefully I'm an example of that. And the, the other thing, Jason, one of the things that comes out of this, out of the book and out of the processes that people go through with this, most people don't do the work to find this out. And that's why 80 or 90% of people are not on purpose is they haven't stopped to lean in like I did, you know, in 1989, spending almost a year to get the baseline and then continue, continue to refine that over my lifetime as I move and mature. I mean, my, if you think about Moses, his job was different when he was 40 than when he was 80. So same thing for me as we move through our maturity and now move in this place of, and I, I got to be careful how I say this, but you, you've earned the right to be a sage. And it's interesting. The, the enemy would like you to say that I'm not worthy. So there are people out there that are, that are potential authors. Oh, well, nobody's going to listen to my story. I, hang on, stop. That's the enemy speaking. That's negative thoughts think, uh, speaking is I've earned the right to be here. Can I learn more? Absolutely. I'm, I'm not, we're never done. We're always learning. But the same thing is don't discount the value you're doing. You're doing that's false humility. That's a disservice. And there's a big difference between confidence and arrogance or conceit. You know, confidence is I, I believe in self, not from a self-centered point of view, but from a self-honoring point of view, a self-value. You've met these people that, oh, Paul, you did a good job. Oh, it was nothing. And they discount themselves. You don't even want to be around that energy because it's just sucking you. So yeah. you, so again, for those people that are thinking about and working with you, I encourage that they connect with you and just go on this discovery to say, what is it that I bring? What's my heart? What's my soul? What's these dynamics that I can do that nobody else can do in my way? And that's what story and publishing, why there will be books forever. So this idea of quest for purpose and you tied it to being authentic and that the, the certain energy that we all intuitively know when a person is communicating authentically versus they're being inauthentic, uh, on that quest for purpose, it seems that, uh, it, it's a, it's a thinking exercise in part, and it's a feeling exercise in part. And if we felt it all, we are probably not going to find purpose. If we think it all, we're probably not going to find purpose because that idea of authenticity it seems that that is a feeling. I know I'm being authentic when I feel I'm being authentic. And, it's a, and it is a distinctly different feeling than being inauthentic. What, what do you talk to, or how do you talk to people when you're, when you're working on, on this idea of purpose, blending this idea of it's a mental exercise and it's an emotional exercise? Where, where does that lie for you? Well, good point. I guess you should be co-author of the new version of the book for sure, Jason. I think that's what we should be making it. Don't tempt me. Okay. I, I want to digress for a second and, and then answer the, the question through the back door. Is that uh, a lot of times people are getting stuck because they're thinking, okay, nobody wants to do this. So my uh, son was probably 12 years old at a Christmas dinner. And my aunt, who was like 85, was there. And she says, and of course, parents do this all the time, which they shouldn't do. Uh, Tim, what do you want to be when you grow up? He says, well, I want to have my own band. And of course, she says, well, what are you going to do for a real job? Well, I was almost dove over the table to slap my aunt about what are you doing to say that to my 12-year-old? And I said, rather than say, okay, why, do you, why is that important to you? Why do you want to do that? He ended up being on a worship team, but now he's a realtor and he's found his space there is that a lot of times when we think about these emotions, we have the wrong kind of emotions coming to it, meaning guilt, uh, obligation, like I was uh, coming. So this cultural pressure, I remember when I left my sales job 
to do this profession. My dad said, why would you leave a sales job? You got a car, you get lunches that are paid for, you have an expense account. What else do you need? It's so, uh, Dad, you're not getting it. Security yeah. from money is not what enriches my life. So we need to be, think practically. I don't want everybody to watch this to quit your job tomorrow. No, 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 don't do that. You want to come from a position of strength, meaning you go on this journey. So what is the quest for purpose from a thinking and a feeling point of view. Our life has left us clues about what we like and what we dislike. I mean, Anthony Robbins says, sometimes you try to figure out who you want to be, but you can't figure it out. So find out what you don't want and then don't do that. So you can go through the back door. However, what we take you through, which is what I did, is that journaling all those things in life that have excited you and energized you. Forget the neutrals, forget the negatives. Now, the other question, and here's why most people don't do it. What's your purpose, Paul? Well, it's too big of a question. It, it, I don't have context for it. What, what does that mean? And purpose isn't just this linear thing. So my purpose in life is to help others to live, lead, and work on purpose. But there's other contexts. So we have what we call 13 different areas in the quest wheel. You know, what's my purpose in my family, my faith, my fiscal responsibility, physicality. So we need to take a look at the holistic part of what meets your need. I need to be outdoors. If I'm not outdoors, if outdoors isn't part of my life, forget it. Yet I sit in front of a computer, writing, talking, doing podcasts for six, seven, eight hours a day. Well, outdoors has to be part of the rest of the day. It just needs to. Otherwise, I can't live my purpose as part of it. So we get people to go through a journey and they create an autobiography. And obviously, if you're older than younger, you're going to have more content. So take all the events in life and we break that down into different components. What are some of the smells, tastes, and touches? So, you know, I'm at a waterfall and the wonders, the water's breaking down and just the sound of that, or I'm in the Hawaii on the beach and that's just something that's exciting. Or me, I'm in front of an audience and I'm 16 years of age and I have 600 people in the room and I'm shaking, but I'm excited and enthralled and I said, this is where I need to go. So we get people to write an autobiography and then to start paying it attention to the clues within that to say, okay, what is the role, responsibility, or calling that fit all those dynamics that are going on? I mean, in the, in the career world, so I've spoken at hundreds and hundreds of career development conferences, and they want to put you into a nas national occupational code or standard industry code. Okay, Paul, you should be this. <laughs> Paul, you don't fit any of those. Okay, no. I'm going to be a business owner, a driver around a publishing company. When I completed an interest inventory, I was supposed to be president of a bank. No, no, you'd probably lose your money, Jason, if that was the case. Leading my own organization around professional development, there's no code for what I do. So the yes, there are some frameworks and there are some benefits some, from some of these interest inventories. But the reality is, is that I need to be able to create my own what we call narrative or journaling of what is most important. So interesting, if you go on this journey for clarity, you can then bring this back into your book. And that's what the quest for purpose, a lot of my story is in that book about what did I go through to get here and to push back on my family, be you know this dairy farmer that had to say no. I wasn't saying no to the family. I was saying yes to my calling, to my purpose. I remember we worked for 10 years as a consulting firm to Chrysler. We were the sole source contract for English speaking Canada. And one of my clients was a, an, an individual who was nearly 40. And I said to him, and by the way, his name was Paul as well. So not to be confused with this Paul. And I said, Paul, I said, you're miserable. Why are you here? He says, well, I am from Asia and I'm the eldest and I'm expected to take over the business. Yeah, yeah. And he said, so he was there. He was miserable every day of his life. And it wasn't a year later, his dad walked in and said, oh, by the way, Paul, we've sold the business, find another job. So he had all this loyalty and I'm not here to speak against the culture, but what Paul was doing, Paul didn't pre uh, prepare himself for this transition and moving out. So there's all these dynamics culturally. And the other one is, why are you trying to go into this business, Ken? There's no, there's no cash flow. You're giving up this job for this process. And a lot of times people get drawn into the shiny object. Oh, I just saw this posting. Well, I even got drawn in the other day. There was this CEO position for this coaching, international coaching firm, and they're going to pay 700K a year for this position. And all of a sudden, no, don't you dare. You don't you dare try to apply for that because these shiny objects, the enemy wants to create distractions to what 
my services. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do right at this time. It has evolved over time to who I'm serving, how I'm serving. And I've become way more focused on, and Paul and I talked about this on a separate call about my faith and how it underpins things. I have my own podcast. And when you think about authorship, but the podcast had a lot of guests, very nice people who did not have the faith underpinning that I did. And they were sharing ideas and concepts that were not congruent, authentic. And I just had to quit the podcast because of that. So I needed to lean into a place where the, the underpinning was foundational and congruent. Mm. You uh, bring up a good point that you operate with certain principles in your life. And I'm curious to hear from you. There are principles, perhaps, uh, that need to be discovered prior to purpose or along with purpose. How do you, how do you, def- how do you, how do you determine your purpose uh, without determining your principles? Well, I think those are uh, one and the same. And glad you asked, Jason, because it's in the book. <laughs> I had looked at some of the other books that were out there and it was interesting. Kenneth uh, Robinson, I think his name was, he's now recently passed away. He wrote the book, The Element. And in that, he has one sentence that spirituality, it doesn't matter for your purpose. I said, what? (laughs) What are you talking about? So in the book, I have three chapters that really are unique to our approach that many of the other purpose books don't have. We talk about meaning before purpose, meaning what is your belief system? What do you really believe? Why are you here? And I reference my friend, Dr. Andy Steiger, who's works, he started ministry, Apologetics Canada, you know, who is God? What does that mean to you? If you're an atheist, they, like no human being has no belief system. Every, every, uh, so I don't believe in anything. Well, that is your belief system. So what yeah. that beliefs is what are those principles? The other one that I, I talk about is mindset. So uh, Dr. Singleman in his book, Learned Optimism, did the best research around uh, pessimism and optimism. You could have your purpose. But if you have a pessimistic mindset, and if you actually look at biblical scripture, I mean, all of us talking about, don't look behind. What are you worrying about? All these scriptures that we could uh, quote, stop it. You're not going to make uh, or realize your full potential if you're a pessimistic mindset. And then number three, the third chapter is character traits. So if I lack integrity, then how am I going to live out my purpose? And the character traits, oddly enough, if you were to actually look at biblical terms, they're generic, but they, they fit into all the principles that we have about how we want to conduct ourselves. One of my mentors in, um, is Marshall Goldsmith. He wrote the bestseller, uh, Triggers, or What Got You Here Won't Get You There. You know, very high paid, not in the same belief system as we are. However, he said, and I was at an event with him in New York, and he, and he was just sharing, he gets paid, you know, significant six-figure numbers to coach the CEOs of the Fortune 1000 companies, he's now retired. He said, but if they lack integrity, I can't work with them. I just can't. You know, if you said you're going to be here at three o'clock and you don't show up and you just kind of uh, spoof me or you ghost me or whatever the case is, or if you say you're going to do it and then you don't get that done, I can't work with you. And so I outline in the book 10 character principles that are foundational to living out your purpose. The other one is forgiveness. You know, why is that one there? (laughs) If you Look at any biblical principles there. And then you talk about lifelong learning. You're never going to stop. So uh, who you associate with. So all of these um, character traits that you can link back to, quote unquote, beliefs are foundational before we even get you into purpose in the book. Good question, Jason. Um, Something that I've been thinking about here, Ken, as I've been listening to you talk is um, just another angle on the definition you gave of purpose, because, um, the upside, right. Is yeah. I'm ghost write a book for somebody. You don't have to ask me if I'm interested in doing that. Right. Um, publish a title that, that fits with our brand. You don't have to ask me that, but I was thinking about, um, the, it's also what you would do, even if you were imprisoned in a gulag. You know, that's another side to it. It's like, it's, it's also what you would do. I remember reading, um, Victor Frankl's book, man's search for meaning. And he was imprisoned in Auschwitz, uh, in world war two. And he's it's on the shelf behind me. Right. And, and he said, you know, the, the people who survived 
were able to cling to a sense of purpose. That was the thing that, that kept them driving forward. And you say, well, what can you do in a place like Auschwitz? Well, you can find something, believe it or not. I know it sounds tremendously difficult and it, and I'm, and I'm quite certain it is, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. And so I found myself thinking, you know, um, I just discovered <laughs> this is how slow I am with technology. I just discovered I can voice dictate into my notes application on my iPhone. You know how revolutionary that is for me? I've got books in my head that I've wanted to write for years, uh, aimed at a particular group of people that I really care about very deeply. And I haven't, and I'm just always like, well, I'll get to that at some point. I'm going to have to sit at my desk and do it. I just dictated like three chapters this afternoon using iNotes. Um, of course it, it'll need plenty of editing and all of that. But the point is, um, that stuff comes out of me uh, when I'm at home alone and nobody's around and I can go and start pretending to be on stage talking about it uh, when I'm in the shower, just monologuing to myself. <laughs> right. Um, and I think it would come out of me even in a situation, in a pretty dire situation, I would still find myself on cloud nine mm. if I got to do, perform that role, even in a very dangerous, uh, debilitating situation. But if I could, if I could impart what I know to a, a younger man and care for his soul and be a fatherly presence to him, I could have a ball in a place like that. Um, not a ball in the sense of living in the lap of luxury. I could just find tremendous inner strength and resilience mm -hmm. by knowing that I have something to offer and someone needs what I have. And I, uh, you know, as I listened to you talk about that, I was thinking for the audience's sake, uh, I, I see a similar thing in your story there, of course, because, you know, you figured out at a fairly young age, the dairy farm wasn't going to work. And at the, and then you, you faced this enormous challenge of dyslexia and we've heard, you know, I've heard the stories of, of how difficult and debilitating that can be. And yet you were utterly convinced that at a level, maybe be maybe beyond even what you understood at several points that you had something to offer and somebody else needed what you had and come hell or high water, you were going to go find out what that was. And so even, and, and so, so with our, with authors, right, that's, that's the kind of thing that will carry you forward through the process of writing, whether you're doing it yourself or doing it with someone else. But if you know that the core fiber of your being that you paid a hell of a price to know what you know and it's not just for you it's for others around you then you will get to that finish line of of publishing and launching and you will go well beyond it carrying that message to whoever it's for and paul you make a very good point let's not assume because you're living on purpose that life is easy right it, it's not it, it, you, we have the same issues. We just have a calling or an assignment. And in fact, I would support your comment that you need that purpose to finish the task. You get into book and you're writing it. And then all of a sudden this next chapter doesn't come together just the way that you wanted it to. And you've got other things that are distracting you. So it's really the calling, the assignment, the purpose that actually helps maintain the resilience and the persistence to get through to the other side. If you're trying to do it without it, then that's very, very difficult to do. Yeah. And it was interesting for me, that was, was, was true with my podcast. When the podcast wasn't underpinned by my spiritual baseline in grounding, then it was no longer sustainable. Yeah. And that's actually where I've grown in the last decade is that if this doesn't have an internal impact, then I'm not that interested. Yeah. And when you think about Paul, my work, it's interesting when you open yourself up a lot of times as believers, we, um, what's the word we, we, um, protect was we're just protective of where we're at and we don't share. And I think you can appropriately share. There's some people that really, uh, proselytize in a, into where they turn people off. 
But I think if you, our spirit is open and I say, use me at this moment to help people. I don't, I can't even tell you how many people that I get on a coaching call where it's totally generic. This person's from the world. They're, they, they don't have a spiritual underpinning and it ends in a prayer with them. Yeah. It just is. And I just say to them, I said, listen, do you, are you okay? Would you mind if I uh, ended this coaching call by praying for you? Well, and, and they say yes. Yeah. And so instead of being in this fear and the satisfaction that comes when the spirit is included in the work that we do, because the first 20 years of my life, it wasn't the anchor point. It now has to be. So even though the, the, the purpose statement is this is similar it's evolved to the point where if he's not part of this thing, then my interest is nominal. Now, if there's a way that it could lead to it, then sure, I'll be open to it. But that has been an evolution of my clarity of where, yes, you get anchored, but then there's times in your life where there's a, a, a new chapter, a new direction, a refreshed direction. Now, we do believe. Now, there might be some theologians who really push back on this. I do believe that our purpose theme stays consistent throughout our lifetime. And then, you know, we talk about personality as well. And here's why, is that that theme of helping people is if all of a sudden he wanted me to be an airplane mechanic, like it just doesn't jive. Right. Plus people would die. You know, they just would. Things wouldn't get fixed. But if he wanted me to go into sort of a different leadership role that had a specific outcome of making a difference in this field that I hadn't really thought about, then I need to be open to that. Yeah. And I, and the other one is for most people, you know, his plans for us are greater than we'd ever have our own. I think we forget that most of the time we try to do it. It's like, hey, kid, can you really inspire me to get to this point? And I appreciate what you are doing for this space to help people with this underpinning in this belief system and then still have a message. If it's like you're saying around plants with the book behind you, Paul, if people are just listening to this, or if it's something else, it doesn't matter. Every, every, you could be the world's best janitor. There's no judgment about that. If that's where you're supposed to be in, being there, uh, I, this just happens to be my space. It happens to be what you folks are doing there and helping in the publishing space. Uh, there's no right or wrong. We need all of us. If it's in law enforcement, which is my partner who does training in law enforcement with the stuff that we do and just saying, I, he said, I just really want to reach the men and women who have integrity in there and be a, a light, a piece of light for this group. And that's what he's doing. You talk about uh, Christians who might be unwilling uh, to share in context of your podcast, right? When it didn't have that spiritual underpinning, it, it uh, fell flat, wasn't authentic perhaps. And I'm curious, there's a, there's a, uh, a concept of shadow, right? Shadow work. The thing, the thing that we, the things we place in our shadow are the things we hide, repress, and deny because I don't want you to see them. And so I kind of pivot around there so that you can't see the stuff that's sitting behind me in my shadow. And I wonder to what degree purpose is sometimes found in that shadow because shadow is not necessarily a negative quality all the time, right? Like, you know, if somebody wanted, if somebody demanded you be a mechanic and you're like, Hey, I'm not a great mechanic. You might you know, to keep the job, you might just throw that, Hey, I'm not a great mechanic in the shadow and like, dance around it. Like, I know what I'm doing. Uh, but it also could be a positive quality. Like, you know what? I really can stand in front of 5,000 people and, and deliver absolutely every time for these people. That's, that might be a positive quality that you, that sometimes people don't want to share those positive qualities for whatever reason. They don't want to be set apart. They, they want to be looked at differently. I'm curious when people are on this path for, for discovery of purpose, where, where around them is purpose st sitting out in front of them is purpose sometimes tucked in that shadow. I'm, I'm really hesitant to bring this thing forward. Where do people look for their purpose? Yes. <laughs> so, your, your question is it, it's all the above and it's at different degrees for all people. So a, a lot of times, and, and I, I got to be careful because I have my own sort of uh, get into trouble with theology questions. And, and I am an ordained pastor, but I don't really tell, make that public. I just said, that's just for my interest sakes. Is uh, a lot of times um, people don't give themselves permission to go in certain directions. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this early. I'm not worthy of this. I don't have the education. 
uh, in this space, that precludes what purpose is. I, I might not have, I mean, I had no education in this area. I did come out of sales into sales training, into this industry, and I was a successful salesperson. But as far as this whole developing training and instructional designer, that was all new for me. And then getting this whole area of leadership and wellness. Now I have a diploma in nutri nutrition and genetics. I said, okay, so we're going to start wellness courses as well. So my encouragement to people is that it's probably all of the above. And here's the other thing. There's, and this goes back to the story of my aunt. Every single person has opinion about what you should do, Jason. Very few people have wisdom. And so if you start leaning into people who have not, I mean, who's the last person you're going to ask for parenting advice? Somebody who doesn't have children, not to judge them, but say, you've not been there. Okay. Yeah. I want marriage advice, but I've never been married. Now, there are a few people who can help you with that, but it's very few. Who are you going to for sage wisdom and advice? And a lot of times you go to other people and then people will talk you out of it. And so this is why we tuck it away. So, oh, you're not going to do that silly training thing, Ken, are you? What are you doing there? We've got this thing going there. And so there's so many sort of external pressures. And now with social media judgments, I, and I would say that if you're thinking about a new path, if you're going on this journey of discovery, that you would do it with people that you trust, that you know that would give you the real goods and say, Paul, you've known me for uh, 10 years. What, what do you see about me that I'm doing? What are the clues that I'm leaving that I'm, I don't even see, which are the sort of the Jahari window? I, I don't even see in myself that I haven't gone credit. And I think sometimes because of the past or where you're at, I mean, uh, this remember this saying. So my father is now going to be 92 at the time of this recording, pretty soon, within a month. He has never told me that verbally that he loves me. I know he does, but his father never did. His mother never did. And, and you remember the old saying, kids are to be seen, not heard. Heard. And what do Paul and I do? Paul's got the radio voice. I've got the training voice. So uh, you could then have that as an emotional anchor. We were talking about, uh, you know, releasing emotions. There can be. Uh, really trigger points in your life where you don't go there because it's just so much pain. Mm. You're going to be a speaker, Ken. Are you kidding me? You need to, whatever. And so there are, there's some work that we need to do. And I believe that that doesn't need to be burdensome. I mean, all the research around counseling right now is if you're trying to relive the pain, you're doing it the wrong way. You need to be looking towards what you want, not reliving it and over and over and over and trying to entrench that sort of into your biology as, as an anchor point. So yes, there's all these things and that's the job that we need to do. And then are you around? I would, I would find a coach. I would find peers. I would find a group of people who uh, are willing to mentor you that are there already, that are doing it, that you can trust that their um, wisdom has background and experience rather than just an opinion. And again, the opinions of, of ruined people's lives, or you've allowed them to come in. And again, we teach personality styles. There's certain personality styles. If I share something with you, then you're devastated. Mm -hmm. And so, so that actually just pops that balloon, wipes out that purpose journey. Um, by, and a lot of times people say things well-meaning like my aunt did. Really, she was trying to protect him to the fact that most magicians don't make money. But that's none of your business to tell him that at 12, not to be in the band. And as adults, we do it all the time. And can we be in discovery? No, most actually try this at a party. This has nothing to do with this interview. Go to a party, go to an event. It doesn't matter, even church. And see if you can go through the entire time and never always ask questions about that person and see who asks questions about you. Yeah. So my wife and I, and, and she's quite sharp. So she will go to a party and we'll be there for two hours with 20 different people and never have a question asked of us. Yep. You know, how's that new business going? How's that going, Paul, over there? Everybody else's emotional intelligence is low. So, okay, no, no, you want to be around people who are curious, who, who are asking questions. So how'd you get in this business, Jason? What's driving you around being uh, emissary in the publishing business and helping others? And so- how can I be this curious person? Those are the people you want around you. Yeah. And uh, as a coach, yes, I mentor and share my experience. But at the same time, I want to find out what's driving you to pull that out. 
to find out what's hindering you, what's stopping you. And in that whole area, of course, obviously we could go on for hours because <laughs> 4 million words of content, which I mean, I just, the, the, sometimes I pitch myself and it's interesting just now in this last 12 months, have I moved to a place where I feel that I am worthy to work with senior leaders in churches, in uh, organizations to mentor and serve them? Because that was part of the thing when I was growing up. I actually was suicidal when I was in my uh, teenage years, just because I was the eldest of a very strict home. My parents were not building. I don't blame them. They did the best that they could. But I've come to this point and I said, even at my age, I said, okay, no, I need to own this space because the enemy doesn't want my experience and track record to be shared with these people to help, you know, major leaders of major organizations to go to the next level and be trusted with somebody who has got a faith underpinning. And I said, there's nothing that excites me more than coaching and working with and mentoring senior leaders who want to go to the next level that have a faith position, because now we can bring the spirit into the conversation, plus all the skills and the stuff that's around this world that we've been exposed to, to help them to go to the next level. So yeah. uh, a couple of things, and I know we're getting a little, uh, we're, we're getting to the, uh, end of our time, but a couple of things I, I, I'm, I, I'm hearing you say one is in the context of protecting somebody else, uh, along their journey of discovery. I, it sounds to me like what you're saying is be careful about protecting other people. Protection is not necessarily the goal. Discovery is the goal. Let them protect themselves as they see fit because it's not your position to necessarily protect them in their, in their, uh, discovery. And then, and then coupling that with, it sounds also like what you're talking about is that, is that purpose is, is, uh, worked out through tactics, but purpose is not a tactic. And I feel like some people might have a tendency to, to combine those two. Like, Hey, my purpose is to be a public speaker. Well, no, that's a tactic for yes. a purpose. What happens if they abolish all public speaking? Is my purpose gone? What, what are your reactions in, in to those? Well, like I said, you're writing a chapter in the book. I, I agree. Concur hundred percent. So the it's, it's, it goes back to the old story that even Simon talked about. It's the why what's my, why the, what and how is not an issue. Find out the why, why am I here? What, what, you know, what really drives me personally, what excites me, what energizes me. I don't even need to know why speaking is important to me. I just know it is. Yeah. Sometimes they're trying to say, well, wh why does it excite you? I don't know. It just does. It just does. So I don't need to figure all that out. You know, if I, once I get to heaven, I'll ask the question, is there an answer to this? And no. Okay. Well, fine. I don't care. So th these are important pieces where we sometimes uh, get into the wrong direction. Uh, and I appreciate that. Now I know before we go, we, we said that we were going to give a free gift. When did you want us to mention how they could get this free gift right now? Never been. Okay. A yeah. <laughs> that was a great segue. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're a pro, I think. Uh, well, there we go. Uh, 500 podcasts later, just the, it could be 500 terrible podcasts, or maybe I grew through it. So, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to give away the ebook, the quest for purpose to everybody is listening and watching. And here's where they're going to find it. They're going to find it in a hidden URL linked to your show at Ken Keys, K E N K E I S dot com backslash emissary. And so uh, emissary is the same as you uh, spell it for your publishing company. And they'll be able to go in there and uh, be able to download the uh, purpose book, the quest for purpose. And it's an ebook and be able to take it through. And if people have questions, Paul knows me well enough. If I can respond, if I have the capacity to respond, we will respond to you. Uh, let the uh, team here, Paul and Jason, know that you were thankful for the gift and, uh, and then continue on from there and just say, Hey, what did I learn from that, uh, through that process? So it's, it's our way to kind of give back. And, and my encouragement is, is that don't just get it and do nothing. It requires you to do the work. Yeah. So you don't become an Olympic athlete because you thought about it. You did it because you went and did the work. So do the work and you will be able to see the results. And with that, it's been great chatting once again on the Emissary Authors podcast with Dr. Ken Keese, uh, author of The Quest for Purpose. We've been on a quest for purpose today, and I think we found it. And uh, 
That means our next purpose is to say goodbye to you until next time. My name is Paul Edwards, my, my co-host Jason Todd. You've been listening to the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders, executives, and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. We'll see you next time.